Uh, welcome back to another classic uh, Rocky and Robert talk about something mm. to try and teach you the, how to do it more good. The R squared format, yeah. The R squared, I like that. That could that can be our podcast, R squared. Yeah. We are here today to talk about requirements. Uh, everyone's and I've, favorite. Everyone's favorite. I don't know if they're my favorite yet or not because I don't really know what they are. And so in the spirit of uh, R squared, Robert and, Robert and Rocky, um, I'm going to get you to teach me what a requirement is and how to do a requirement that is good mm. and not bad. Okay, so a set of requirements aims to describe exactly what the system has to do to do the job that it's supposed to do. So we have something that we want to achieve. You can call it the stakeholder need or you can just call it the need, but that sits right at the top and it drives everything. Right. And then the requirements sit one level below that and they are basically translating that need or aim or objective into specific technical things that a technical person of the right sort can look at and make a decision about whether your system, whatever you've built, meets that requirement or not. And if you've written your requirements correctly and you've verified that your system meets all the requirements, then it should do the thing that the stakeholder wanted. And that, that's why we do it. We do, we do requirements so we don't accidentally spend like $2 billion and then at the end realize we built the wrong thing for the job. Right, so it's <clears throat> making sure we're building the right thing for the job by specifying exactly what the thing needs to do. So it's a, yeah. list, of, a list of things that our thing needs to do to be considered yeah. a success at doing the job we need it to do. They're really to specify exactly the capabilities of the thing that's being delivered. Right. How do we use requirements? What do we do? So presumably first we have to write them, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what do we do with them after we've written them? Well, before you can do the requirements, you need to have a really clear idea of the stakeholder need or the need or the objective or the aim, whatever you want to call it. But it's basically the English written statement of what you're aiming to do. The goal. The and it big, should be related to the stakeholder and what they want. So then you write them, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then afterwards, they guide what you actually build. So after you've written the requirements, you build something to satisfy those requirements and you don't need to build something guided by anything else. It's a tool to let you enable you to move on to the next part of the job of actually designing the thing, which will be correct because you've done your requirements correctly, it'll do the job. And it's also a way of making sure that you don't spend your time doing the wrong things or you don't get off task and, and, and you know, use up your budget before you've actually finished building the thing. Right. So if you write a good requirement, it's supposed to be what we call implementation agnostic, which just means that it doesn't tell you how to do your job. It just tells you like what, what you need to is. get done. Yeah. yeah. So okay. it's like, you know, instead of your dad saying, go sweep the yard with the orange broom, he might just say, make sure the yard doesn't have any leaves in it when I come home. And then you might decide you're going to use the leaf blower because it's like 10 times easier. So that's a good example of why writing the requirement in a implementation agnostic way is beneficial to both you and presumably your dad because it got done faster or something. So this is the NASA Systems Engineering Handbook uh, and we are currently in, is it Appendix C or D? Appendix C. Appendix C, how Appendix to write C a good requirement. As how to write a good requirement. Yeah. So they have a checklist here you can use. Some of the checklist terms are really good, some are not as useful as the others, but if you start with C1, use of correct terms, now they give you three options here, shall, will, and should. Uh, but for you, I would encourage you to just use the word shall. So every single one of your requirements should be a sentence that's grammatically correct, and it should use the word shall to say what your system has to do. Let's say it's like a radiometer measuring the amount of light power from something. You might say, the system shall be sensitive to radiation from 400 nanometers to 1100 nanometers. It's pretty simple, it says what needs to happen and it uses yep. the word shall to do it. It's also grammatically correct and it's written in active voice. So we have a particular way that it needs to be written. Uh, what else does our requirement need to have when we're writing it? So <clears throat> they should be positive, i.e. they shouldn't say what the system should not do. You shouldn't say that the system shall not have a resolution greater than blah. You'd just say the system resolution shall be less than. 
whatever. Mm -hmm. you know? One thing we haven't talked about requirements yet is that they need to be verifiable, which is a fancy word, basically for testable. And what that means for you is that you should be able to make a test or some sort of simulation to determine whether you've met the requirement or not. Right. So an example of a terrible requirement is the system shall be power efficient. So if I gave you a system and I said, Rocky, tell me whether it's power efficient, there's no way you could say yes or what no. What do you mean I, by I power I guarantee efficient? you, yeah. you cannot determine whether it's power efficient or not because I haven't included this kind of the performance bar of what you need to meet. So if you wanted to say whether it's power efficient or not, you need to define what power efficient is. So you could say, um, the system shall consume less than 0 0.6 watts during operation. And then that's something you can, now you don't have to do this by the way, but that's something you can pass off to somebody else and the test engineer can determine whether the requirement's been met or not. So you probably will verify some of these, but you don't have to worry about that now. You just have to worry about writing one that can be verified. And, and we can help you with that, but um, basically if there's no bar where you can say yes or no, pass or fail, then, then it's not a good requirement. <clears throat> right. So it's almost like, it kind of reminds me of marking criteria, yeah, right? Like yeah. it's almost like we're writing the marking criteria for ourselves yeah. and then, we, then we're then we going to go turn around and make an assignment yeah, that tries yeah. to like yeah. score as many points yeah. as we so can. So if your assignment criteria. is to make the payload, then the requirements are really the assignment instructions. Yeah. Cool. Tells you what to do. And, and also, <clears throat> it means if the you know the, your boss or the teacher comes over and says you didn't do this, you can say, well, it wasn't in the assessment instructions, so I didn't have to do that. And then they'll go, oh, okay, and walk away. So, <laughs> it's good. So they should be singular. So don't wrap two things in the one requirement. Uh -huh. um, make another requirement. Uh, I'd say they're free, but they're really not. The more requirements you have, the more money you'll spend on your project. So. That's the other thing about requirements. It's really tricky to figure out how many you should have. And I've got a really good engineer answer here. So Rocky, you can ask me the question. Robert, how many requirements should you have? Rocky, you should have enough requirements. How many is enough, Robert? You'll know when you're... When you're <laughs> or maybe, maybe you won't, maybe, but we will know when you've got enough. We'll help you. But we use this word coverage to describe basically how complete the list of the requirements is. Right. So like perfect coverage or 100% coverage, you know, that theoretically sounds great, right? But the truth is you're never going to get there. There's no guarantee that the thing you'd actually build would really be any better. Like there's maybe a small chance that it would have caught something that you messed up when you only did 20 requirements by doing 40. But you probably spent twice as much effort doing it. So the, the real the difficult thing and the tricky balancing act is, is having enough requirements to cover the important stuff, but no extra requirements that aren't needed. Because every requirement will basically cost you time and money. Um, so, you know, if it means that your payload doesn't get built in time for the launch and you don't get to see it to go to space before you graduate or something, it's kind of a bummer. So, you know, it's important to, like, to tread the fine line. And we'll help you with that. But if you're at home, you're thinking about your payload, you know, maybe aim for sort of 6 to 12 requirements. Probably don't do any more than 12, yeah. All right. But there's no real basis for those numbers. I just don't want you to do too many. Oh, and one more important thing about requirements is like 99% of the, if I was going to pay Rocky like $100 for a requirement, he would get 99 of those dollars for just writing the requirement in words, even if he didn't know the number value to go in. So let's say I didn't know it was 10 nano Tesla, right? $99 of the, of the $100 of value is for saying the, the sensor sensitivity shall be better than TBD nano Tesla. So if you don't know the number value that should go in, it's totally fine to write TBD if you don't know the value or TBC. So TBD is to be determined and TBC is to be confirmed. It's really important to- 99% of the value is writing down in the spreadsheet that you know you need this requirement and right. the, you ensure that you never forget about it. So that's why I'm not too concerned about the number you're putting, just that you know that you need the number. Right. So if you were looking down at the earth, it might be something yeah. like, we know we need to be able to see things that are TBD kilometers in uh, size. Yeah, yeah. And that's, right? yeah. And this could lead us on to like common requirements that you might have. And, and the real common ones for earth observation are, are ground sample distance, which is basically how big your, your uh, pixels are on the ground when you like project them from the camera looking at the ground. And then the other one is, is resolution or what's the smallest thing you can see. 
right? And, and other common ones are temporal resolution, which is how often you want to do. So you could say uh, the system must capture the ozone uh, concentration uh, at least once per second or something like that. And there's other ways of saying that, but that's a good way to say it for now. And I would encourage you to write them in a non-technical way. Instead of saying like, oh, the diffraction limited <coughs> resolution, you could just say the system must be able to see forests of 20 meters and larger or something like that. Yeah. Or, or forests that are bigger than 20 meters or something like that. Then write it like that and we'll figure out the fancy words later. Or maybe we don't even need them. Because to be honest, if you can communicate something with simple words, you don't need fancy words. So The requirements should be written at a high school level so that everyone can understand them no matter what technical discipline they come from. Right, there's no point and, writing and a bunch of requirements. No matter that, whether it's like 2 a.m. in the morning, the night before it launches on the rocket, or if you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed sometimes. So Exactly. Yeah. So the whole, the whole point of them is that everyone agrees on what they are. Yeah. That's, that's what they're for. Writing them isn't, we're not just writing them to write them, we're writing yeah. them to force us to sit down and agree on what yeah. we're trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and they're going to be really useful too. If you feel like, oh, they're just making us do this like, Paperwork exercise because they love paperwork. I mean, it's not that we love paperwork, <laughs> but it's that you really need paperwork if you're going to succeed. But they're actually really important, and they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna set what you're actually going to spend the next year or two building. So it's important to get right because it's really the spec to what you're going to. Yeah, so we're defining yeah. what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. Like, mm, okay, well we I'll read you out examples? some example ones. Yeah, okay. Um, from a mission we're working on been our prospector, but we're just going to focus on one of the payloads. So this payload is Which a... Which is the same thing that you're building. You're yeah, also exactly. building a payload. Um, this one's a science payload, and it's a magnetometer, which the requirements and the preliminary system design have been developed by Jacob here at the Space Science Technology Center. Uh, so let's see. Let's find some ones that are like uh, a good example. Okay. So your requirements should be, at this stage, a spreadsheet. Write the mission need or aim or objective up the top of the spreadsheet so you don't forget about it. Then underneath you want three columns. You want ID, mm -hmm. name, mm -hmm. and requirement. Yep. The ID is a unique ID number. So if you're, let's say, in this case, the payload is a magnetometer. So they all start with mag. So we have mag-01, mag-02, mag-03, and just use caps because everybody does it. And in systems engineering and in engineering and technical stuff in general, if there's an accepted way of doing things, you don't want to do things your own special way. You just want to follow the convention. I know it might sound boring, but it basically lets everyone get their work done faster. So capital M-A-G-01. In this case, it's MAG-14. The name of the requirement, which is the next column, is data buffer. And then the requirement, uh, which you might hear also referred to as the shall statement, is the magnetometer shall store data for at least 48 hours. So it tells you what it must do and the, the performance level that it must do it to. And one other thing I'd say is when you're doing your requirements, focus on your mission and why you're doing it. Don't worry really about the CubeSat or BinRx or the bus. Um, <clears throat> we're actually gonna develop for you a special set of sort of technical requirements to make your payload stay within the constraints of what we can offer you. But, but for now, don't worry about that. Yeah, right. Just well, worry about your you mission. The ones that will help yeah. you answer your, your big questions. Exactly. Your big problem. Because we can do those technical ones anytime and they don't require your effort. So you, we want you to focus on your mission. All right. So you're going to come to Curtin in a few weeks or maybe sometime in the future if you're watching this video in a bit. <laughs> um, and you're going to come in and we're going to review your requirements. Now, you don't have to have them perfect before you come in. That's not the point of the review. The point of the review is to improve them. So. Have a go at writing your requirements. You need yeah. to make you now. You need to make a spreadsheet. You can use whatever file format or online spreadsheet thing you want. But up the top, you need to write your mission, need, objective, or aim, which should, probably should be two sentences, maybe one, maybe three. Um, and then below it, you need three columns. You need ID, you mm -hmm. need name, and you need requirement. So the ID will be like before, It'll be like mag-01 or mag-02. But some some little prefix and then dash numbers from one to don't do more than 12. And then you have your requirement name, so you might call it uh, spectral resolution might be the name. Yep. And then for the requirement, you might say uh, the spectral resolution of the sensor shall be less, shall be better than two nanometers or something like that. Yep. Um, and that's your shall statement or your requirement. So bring those in. Uh, yeah. So you have, your the, mission. have the best crack that you can at writing yeah. them. 
just limit yourself to 12. You're not allowed to do 13. You're only allowed to do 12. But you know, if you can do, if you can get good coverage in six, then you should only do six. Uh, and focus on the most important ones. I guarantee you, you cannot get 100% coverage. You cannot get every requirement. Like, no matter how long you spend, you can't get them all. So you just want to get the six or the 12 most important requirements, and then you're good. And then bring that in, and we'll have a look at them. We'll help you improve them. And we're also going to do some other activities to sort of help you work on what you're going to do next to build your space payload and get up into space, which is that's the goal. So. Cool. All right. Hope that helps, and we'll, uh, we'll see you real soon. Cheers. This is uh, R Squared signing off. <laughs>